So today we would like to talk about another method of analyzing trusses. Uh, the, the one we learned last time, if you remember, was called method of joints. And today we're going to learn another method called the method of sections. But first, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit more conceptually about trusses uh, before I get to the, you know, actually covering what to do whenever we are getting ready to, to solve one using the method of sections, okay? So, the very, very broad question first. <coughs> You've probably noticed that trusses um, are typically arrangements, the, the, the members of trusses typically get arranged in a series of triangles. Um, probably most of you have noticed that. And what I want to talk about first is why is that? Why is it that a triangle is such a stable structural shape? Okay, so that that way we have an idea as to why, it, you know, it's not just random that these are triangles. We have an idea as to why uh, these shapes are so stable. So let's think about this. Um, one of the things that is true for materials is that it takes force to cause them to change in length. Would you agree with that? As a matter of fact, it typically takes a lot of force to make them change in length even a little bit, right? Like they are typically, if you've got a, like a long slender member and it's made of the kind of material that you might have in mind that a structure would be made out of, right? Something like wood or steel or uh, something, aluminum, whatever. If it's, if it's that kind of material, then getting the thing to change even 1% of its length takes typically a lot of force in order to make that happen. So for all practical purposes, we can kind of think of these members as being stiff, right? Stiff is a technical, you can say perfectly stiff, right? You can think of them as being very stiff in a direction that would cause them to change length. So if it's really, really difficult to make a member change in length, then what you can imagine here um, is that if you arrange three members that will not change in length easily, right? So let's say I've got these three members that will not change in length easily, and I arrange them like this, how many different triangles can I make once I've said that each of the sides of this thing have to stay the same length as they are? In other words, they're, they're not going to change in length. How many different shapes can I make once I've specified the length of each side? One, right? It's unique. You know, a triangle where you've specified the length of all three sides is a unique triangle, right? And therefore, because the, you know, again, because the sides don't change in length, uh, it is a shape that is not going to be easily changed once we've attached all the ends together and they're not allowed to change in length. Contrast that with what if I had four members, okay? What if I had a member here, you know, so maybe I show things like this and I put four together like this. And I again apply the rule that says none of my members there that I've got are, are allowed to change in length. How many, unique, how many shapes can I make if I arrange four of them like this with pins at their ends? Okay. Okay, some of you are saying exactly the right thing. Basically, infinitely many because I can change, for instance, this angle right here, right? And with none of the, sh none of the sides changing in length, I can make that a different shape, right? I can basically skew it a little bit further one direction or the other. And this is the fundamental principle that makes it to where these three-sided you know, figures that we put in here, these three triangles, make strong structures. And so then we chain a bunch of them together and make a structure that's strong over a longer span, okay? Um, I will forego it for right now, but an interesting thing to think about is this is in 2D. Right? I've, I've defined what a stable structure is in 2D with the assumption that the individual members can't change in length, and it turns out that it's a triangle. What if we move to 3D? Okay, someone says a pyramid, right? We can be even more precise with that. Um, there's a particular type of pyramid that's out there called a tetrahedron. All right, and so in 3D, uh, the analogous shape to a triangle would be a tetrahedron, and that would hold it a particular shape, assuming that the 
sides are not allowed to change in length. Okay, so that's what I wanted to start off with is this really big idea of why is it that these arrangements of triangles make these stable structures. Uh, and it's because every time you specify the three sides of a triangle, it means that you have made a unique shape of triangle and it can't change its shape without the sides actually changing in length, which they don't do easily. Okay. All right. So let's get into, you know, we have different ways that we can arrange uh, a lot of these members. And I want to show you this very first one here first, um, you know, the, the picture right here. Okay. I'm going to tell you that that is a statically determinate truss. Okay. And what I would like to do is show you how I know that this is statically determinate. And then also, what do I even mean by statically determinate? Okay. First, let me give you that actually. The big idea as to what I mean by statically determinate. Okay. What it means is that in order for me to find the force carried in the members of this structure, I do not need to know anything about how the member how, or how the structure will deform, how any of the members of the structure will deform. In other words, the members can change in length a little bit, right? And I don't need to know how much they changed in length as a result of loading the structure to know how much force is going to exist in every member, okay? I can do a force analysis independent of a deflection analysis, okay? And when anytime that's the case, we call that structure a statically determinate structure. Well, here's what I want you to know. I want you to know how would you go about looking at a truss and knowing whether or not it is statically determinate, right? So the, the big answer for that question, we go back to math. And we say, do we have enough equations to where we can solve for all of our unknowns, right? Do we have enough equations where we can solve for all of our unknowns in that structure, okay, without having to call upon equations that, you know, we evaluate how long a member is or how much a, a member changes in length. So how would we know that for this structure right here? How many equations can we bring to bear on that structure? Assuming we're not going to do any deflection equations to figure out how, how you know, much each member changes in length. How many equations do we have at our disposal? OK. Well, so keep in mind, I'm, I'm counting all equations, not just to find external reactions. right? I'm saying, what are all the equations that I could bring to bear on that structure? And I would say that one way of thinking about it is that equilibrium for the entire structure is a consequence of each joint being in equilibrium. In other words, I can say that the whole thing is in equilibrium if each joint is in equilibrium, right? And therefore, this is actually a good point for me to bring up. Doing a free body diagram of that whole structure, right, robs a principle from the principle I just said that every joint is in equilibrium. In other words, the whole thing being in equi equilibrium is already implied by each joint being in equilibrium. And that's why you might remember our problem we did last time, we wound up with three extra equations at the end. That is an example of where we, we already used three principles to figure out what those external reactions were right at the beginning of that problem, right? And that meant that we had three extra ones when we got to the end. All right, so back to the joints. How many equations can we write for each joint? Because we're trying to answer the question, how many equations can I write total? And I'm talking about independent equations. Okay, Two for each joint, someone says, right? And so for this problem, how many joints do I have? OK. We've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So I should be able to write 22 independent equations for that structure. OK? How many members do I have in that structure? OK? Let me count them. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. OK? I've got 19 members 
with 22 available equations. What's the difference between 22 and 19? Three. Okay. What you see there is that just to find member forces, I would need 19 variables answered for. Right? And then I've got these three extra that show up, and I've got, you know, because I've got three extra equations as a result of counting up two times the number of joints, right? What do you think those three represent? Those reaction forces, right? And so I'm going to go ahead and, and give you this and say, if you want to know whether or not a truss is statically determinant, and I need to add one other condition on here as well, where you have it simply supported, right? That's the name for how I have this supported. That means you've got one pin and one roller, OK? If you want to know whether or not it's statically de determinant and it's supported like that, what you basically do is you count up the number of members. And if the number of members is equal to two times the number of joints minus three, then you will have a statically determinant truss. OK? So that's a condition as long as you've got three external reactions, which is a very common way to support a truss. OK? So let's contrast that with something. That's what I've got down below there. What is a statically indeterminate structure? OK, well, let's look at this structure right here. Right now, it's no different than my first one. Right? So right now, it's not statically indeterminate because it's the same as the first one that we just said was statically determinate. But let me change it a little bit. What if I add one more member that I put right here? Okay? So I basically say I'm not satisfied with that trust the way it is. I'm going to throw one more member in right there. Maybe I do that as a result of maybe I load the truss, and maybe the, it actually deforms outward a little bit or something, and I'm not happy with that, and I want to brace it up a little bit more by putting another member underneath. OK? That's a reasonable thing for me to maybe want to do, right? Well, let's now think about this. OK? First of all, let's think about it from the standpoint of the equation that we just did, right? I added a member. Did I do anything to the number of joints? OK? So now, what you notice here is that m is going to be greater than 2j minus 3. OK? So if that's what you see, then you probably have a statically indeterminate structure. OK? But let's talk about why physically. All right? Let's go back to our idea of these members don't change in length easily, right? So we kind of envision them mentally as being perfectly stiff. Right? These two joints where I connected that member, this joint right here and this joint right here, before I connected the member, so let me take it back out of there again real quick. Before I connected that member, if none of these members were allowed to change in length, would those two points right there move at all relative to each other if I applied a load to this structure? No. Those are already located. They're already stable with respect to each other. They're, they cannot change in position. Uh, you know, from each other already without adding any other material onto the truss. And so that means if I'm going to add this other member, then I have to do it, first of all, I have to make it exactly the right length in order for me to able, even be able to install it, right? That's not true for any of the members if you've got a statically determinate truss. If you have a statically determinate truss, then you change the length of any one of your members a little bit, the whole thing will still go together with no trouble, okay? Whereas on the statically indeterminate truss, and for me to add this member here, first of all, I've got to make sure it's exactly the right length or else it won't even go onto those pins because those pins are already set as far as their length apart from one another. OK? Well, so what if I made it a little bit too short? Could I still get it on there? OK? Someone, some people are shaking their heads. No, you can't get it on there. And that's true if the members won't change in length. But is that the way real materials behave? They actually will change in length a little bit, right? 
And turns out over long stretches like this, it doesn't take very much of each one of them having to change in length to accumulate and be able to see a certain amount of length uh, or, or difference in position under a, under a load. So my, you know, if you go back to this and think practically, yeah, I can get it on there. I can put it on there even if I made it a little bit too short. But what do I have to do? I've got to actually deform the structure some, right, and put stress in it in order to just install that one member. So one of the features of a statically indeterminate structure is that they often have what's called residual stress. Okay? And that's basically a stress it is causing itself. Right? It's not due to an external load being applied. It's basically, you know, someone put a member there that may not have been exactly the right length and you had to stress it just to get it put in. Okay? And there can be other reasons too why that might happen, but this is a, an example. So this is a statically indeterminate truss. Um, and it means, like another practical consideration on it is, um, you know, let's actually, let's look at these two members. What if I take this member out right here? Okay. Is it statically indeterminate or statically determinate now? It's good again, right? It's back to statically determinate, right? So now, one way of looking at this is if I, if I take, I'm going to actually make them two different colors. Let's say I've got this green member here, and I've got this blue member here. One way of looking at this structure is that if I put a load on it, I now don't know how much of that load gets shared to the green one, and how much of the load gets shared to the blue one. Like, how much of the load is each one of those pieces carrying? And I can't answer that question without also analyzing how much everything deforms. You have to do it at the same time. Analyze how much it deforms at the same time as analyzing how much force each thing takes. All right. I don't want to beat this totally to death, but you know, I, want you to get you, I want you to get this idea as to what a statically determinate structure is versus a statically indeterminate structure. And let me give you maybe the best news that you uh, might hear today. We focus in this course on statically determinate structures. All right? We leave the question of statically indeterminate structures mostly for the next mechanics and materials course that you're going to take. Okay? Because those do come up and we do need to be able to analyze them. But for now, let's just get comfortable with our statically determinate structures. Okay? Well, we have another category as well beyond this statically indeterminate category. What happens if I go to the same structure again and I remove this member, and I don't replace it with anything. And then I try to load it. Say I put a force on here. What will happen with that structure? OK. This end will, will hold steady, but this end over here becomes a skateboard, and it's going to swoosh out to the side like that, and the thing is going to do what? Going to fall down like this. OK. Well, let's count up our little equation right there, members versus joints, right? What do we have now? OK. We have fewer members than 2 times the number of joints minus 3. OK. Now I'm going to add one more thing to it just to you know, kind of mess with you a little bit. All of these. Um, cases that I've shown you up here have been predicated on this idea of having a simply supported structure, meaning a pin at one location and a roller at another location. Okay? Well, let's add another possibility here. What if I replace this skateboard over here, and instead of making a skateboard, I put another pin? Okay? It's no longer a skateboard. I just added another pin right there. Okay. Is this, you know, is this a possible structure? Is this an indeterminate structure? Is it determinate? What do you think? Okay. It does become a statically determinate structure again, and how can we tell? Okay. Basically, what we did relative to the very first example. We took away one member, so that would have been one unknown that we had to solve for, right? Took that away, but what did we replace it with? A reaction down here that's another unknown, and so we end up 
balancing the number of equations we have at our disposable, uh, disposal with, um, with the number of unknowns. You got a question? Okay, so the question is, if you have a situation where you have a statically, let me go back to what we had before here, where we had a roller, right? So we have our plane uh, simply supported, statically determinate structure, right, with this, as long as this member is right here, right? His question is, what's the point of having the roller there instead of just putting a pin on both sides anyway, right? So... In other words, he's saying, what if I got rid of this roller again and I put in another pin? Okay. Who wants to take a stab at that question? Okay. So let's actually answer it in very practical terms. Let's say that these pins that we're going to try to attach this truss to are built in concrete. Okay. And you're going to put those in the ground. Those are going to be what this truss is supported on. And when you do that, you tell your contractor, you say, the span of the truss is going to be 20.000 feet long. Right? So the contractor goes out there with his tape measure, puts this thing in, and he makes them 20 feet apart. Right? He did his job. Turns out, though, they're 20 point one actually let's make it this way 20.01 right feet apart and the people that made your bridge made your truss made it to where the ends wound up being 20.000 feet long now what okay you're going to have to stretch that structure to get it put on those supports or you're going to have to move the supports the point is, though, the supports are going to cause stress in the structure without there being any load even applied to it, all right? It'll be harder to build. It'll be, you know, pre-stressed, okay? Okay, so his, his point that he just made is, I know it'll matter because the other thing that can happen is the thing can change temperature, right? And as it changes temperature, everything can change size as it changes temperature. So maybe that would cause it to want to push on the supports as well. That's a really good point. I didn't want to miss it, right? That's a really, another really good point. As a matter of fact, you need to have joints like this in, uh, in bridges, in roadways, and that kind of thing. Sometimes they're called expansion joints because your, your uh, different pieces need to be able to expand and contract without breaking the uh, supports that you put the thing on. Okay, but he did say just now that that wasn't his question precisely. His question was, what about mathematically? Okay, so let's at, try to answer that question. What about mathematically? What if, I, what if I have this structure that has a pin on each end? All right, and I try to start doing, let's say, a, a method of joints, and I go through it. Okay. What would be the first step of solving a method of joints type problem if we use our technique we did last time? We would do like a moment at one of the pins to try to find reactions at the other pin. Okay. You, you may not even be able to find your external reactions first because you don't know how much stress has been built up in the structure. Right? So that might, you might get stymied right there at the very beginning because the tr structure has uh, the potential of having force built up in it before you even uh, try to start solving it. Okay? Another practical thing that can happen with your solution is if you, uh, well, you can get different answers by going through it in different directions because your, your assumptions aren't really holding, right? You don't have the right number of external reactions. So anyway, the point is, you're not going to be able to really deal with it until you start simultaneously considering how much each member deforms. And so I just, I'm trying to help you understand that right here at the beginning. Okay, so um, just to kind of make sure no one ends up confused here so that my picture matches. 
what it's labeled as. This was an, um, when I had no member right there and a roller on one end, that was unstable because my number of members is less than two times the number of joints minus three. All right, maybe that gives you a little bit of a, a clue here on these. Um, one, actually one last thing I'm gonna touch on on this point before I leave it. Anytime you see a, uh, a structure that contains what's called a wheel, and this is a, a definition of a wheel, is anytime you have uh, essentially spokes all going into a central node with members going all the way around the outside of it, okay? That means that that little piece right there is going to be statically indeterminate. And the reason why is you can remove one of these pieces, right? I can remove, let's say, that edge right there. And how, how do my number of joints relate to my number of members? Okay, I've got four joints with five members, all right? So two times four minus three, right? So that would be eight minus three would be five. So it's statically determinant like that, and I added another member on right? And it doesn't matter how many spokes I put on this, you know, you can put a larger number of spokes, but anytime you have a structure that's shaped like this, where there's like a center node with a ring that goes all the way around it and spokes to every one of the nodes, that will end up making a statically indeterminate chunk of your structure. You can take out any one of the edges and it becomes statically determinate again, but with all of them in there, it Okay, yeah, any one of the edges. I could take out this one right here, and now it's statically determinate again. Okay, yeah. Very good. Thank you for bearing with me on that, but I think it's, it's nice to understand some of these ideas so that you have some idea as to what kinds of structures you're going to be able to deal with using our techniques we use in here versus some that you might not be able to without something more. Okay, all right. We're going to get in now to the method of sections, okay? Let me just start right here. With the method of sections, instead of doing our free body diagrams of joints, we are, instead of doing that, we're going to take apart our structure, instead of all the way down to being, going down to joints, we're going to take it apart and look at individual sections of the truss, okay? So I've, I've illustrated two different ideas here. From our initial, for an initial problem like is shown on the left side, the method of joints would say we should take that down and look at each joint individually and do free body diagrams of each joint and therefore we'll be able to find all of the forces in the members. Okay, It's not wrong. You can do it that way. But sometimes it's helpful to have another method and where it's really helpful is where you are trying to find the forces that exist on members that are very far away from the supports. Let's say you have a very long structure with a lot of members in it. And let's say you're on, a, on an exam and you have six minutes to solve the problem. Okay? And so let's say you've got one, I'll, I'll even draw one up here, all right? Let's say you've got one where here's the structure. Okay, you getting nightmares yet? Okay, it'll take me a while even to just draw the whole thing. Here's the structure. All right, and you have supports at each end, something like this. You put some loads on it, however those look, something like that. And all of a sudden, your professor, who before this appeared like he might be a kind individual, asks you to find the force in that member right there. And you've got six minutes on the test to be able to find that. Okay, what would you have to do if you, all you knew was method of joints? 
okay? You got to start on one end or the other, and you're going to start picking through from joint to joint to joint to joint, just like we did on our last example problem. And you're going to have to go all the way down the line until you get to that member right there that you're supposed to find the force in. Would that take a while? Probably so, okay? But the, your professor is not asking for all the forces. The professor is really only asking for the force in that member, right? And so what you can do, if that's the only thing you're interested in, you can do something like the right figure that I'm showing down there. And instead of taking it all the way down into individual joints, all the way across the whole structure, you can leave parts of it together. Leave this side together, leave that side together. And now, instead of doing a free body diagram of joints, we'll do free body diagrams of whole sections of the truss. And therefore, we'll be able to solve for some of the things that we don't know on the inside of it. That's the big idea. Okay? And hopefully, that also helps to describe why it is that we might want to do something like this. Right? If you, all you care about is just one spot inside the, the structure, and you need to get to that one spot quickly, the method of sections is very often uh, a useful way to go about doing it. Okay, so let's do an example problem. All right, so here's an example problem where we have all of the uh, members arranged, we've got all the geometry set up, and we know that there's a couple of forces being applied. A 5 kilonewton force to the left at joint A, an 8 kilonewton force downward at J. Okay? And what it's saying here is that we need to find the force carried in member DJ. Okay? So where's that? This guy right here. And if we were going to do this by the method of joints, Again, what would we have to do? We'd have to start somewhere, right? Uh, some people might suggest, well, we could start at joint C. There's a support not too far away, right? We start at joint C. But can you really? How many unknowns do you have at C? Yeah, C is a difficult one to just get started with. Right? You might have to do a few moves before you even get to joint C. Okay? Okay, well then you could say, well, I could start over there at H. Right? That one's easier to start with. You can start with H. But then how many joints do you have to work through before you get to DJ? Probably a, a, a good many, right? At the minimum, I would say about four joints before you can get to, uh, to joint J. Okay? Not an easy thing to go straight to DJ. So now what we're going to do is introduce method of section so that we can go more or less straight to DJ. Here's the thing, though. Before we even get to the point of doing that, we still have the same initial step that we needed to do for method of joints. We need to do that same initial step for the method of sections. That initial step is what? Doing a free body diagram of the whole thing. Okay. So I'm going to copy this and set it right here. And I'm going to turn it into a free body diagram. How do I do that? I'm freeing the body, right? So I've got to free it from its supports. And replace the supports with what? Reactions that would reflect the types of forces that must be uh, at least available to react at those locations. Okay, so there's a couple. Uh, we'll call this one, say, R C Y. Okay, and maybe I'll put another one there, R C X. Okay, why would I put two right there? It's a pin at that location, and as a pin, it can react both directions. Down here is a roller, so I can only react basically normal to the direction that it will roll against, right? <clears throat> 
which in that case is going to be upward. So there's my free body diagram of the whole thing. And what do I do with it? Okay. What we always do with free body diagrams is do equilibrium equations, right? Shouldn't say always. Once you get into dynamics, you'll do other kinds of equations called equations of motion, right? But in here, what we do with a free body diagram is equilibrium equations. So which equilibrium equation would you like for me to look at first? OK. So R, someone says RCX, OK. We can certainly do that one if you would like. We can sum forces in the x direction. And what will we find? Negative 5 kilonewtons plus RCX will be equal to 0, right? So what do we say RCX is going to be? 5 kilonewtons. Really good warm up there. OK. Not bad. What next? OK. We can do the y. We can try to do a y equation. What's the problem with going to the summation of forces in the y? We have two things we don't know in that direction right now. We have RCY and RHY that we, we don't know either one of them. So what might be a good one to do first? Some moments, OK? Someone says, what if we do that around joint C? OK, and I'm going to take counterclockwise here to be positive as I do this sum, OK? Let me start with my 5 kilonewtons. Does that tend to cause clockwise or counterclockwise rotation around C? Clockwise. So I'm going to count that with a negative 5 kilonewtons at what length? Someone says six meters. OK, that's good. What next? We can try to do the eight kilonewton. Got to be kind of careful on these, right? I made this one a little bit tricky, partly on purpose, right? How do I know the length between the eight kilonewton, which tends to also rot this, rotate this clockwise, right? So I'll take neg negative eight kilonewtons. But how do I know the length? to use. OK. So you might notice here, we basically have a line back here that relates the upper horizontal dimensions with the lower horizontal dimensions. So relative to that line, it's going to be 4 meters plus 3 meters. So it'll be 7 meters from that line. But then that's not the line I want to find that distance relative to, right? I want to find it relative to point C. So what do I have to do? Subtract 2.5. So I have 7 meters minus 2.5 meters to give me the length that I'm needing there. So what's 7 meters minus 2.5 meters? Is it 4.5? OK. All right, so then what other forces do I have that would cause moments around point C? OK, RHY, what direction? OK, counterclockwise around C, right? So I would add RHY times what? This one becomes a little bit more simple because I've got 3 meters plus 3 meters plus 2.5 meters, right? So just based on the upper dimensions up there. So that'd be 8.5 meters. OK, and therefore I can solve for RHY. RHY is going to end up being <coughs> 5 times 6 plus 8 times 4.5, all this divided by 8.5. 7.765. OK. 
Okay? Kilonewtons. All right. Now that we have one of those unknown y forces, now it's not a bad thing for us to think about the, uh, and I'll tell you what, I'm going to write these on here, but it's not a bad thing for us to think about our forces in the y direction. Okay, 7.765 kilonewtons. Up here, RCX, um, this is going to be equal to 5 kilonewtons. And what's RCY going to be? Or how do we figure it out? Okay. That's right. So to know, he says basically, uh, you know, RHY minus RCY should balance out the 8 kilonewtons, right? But let's go ahead and do it formally here. So we've got. Uh, RHY at 7.765 kilonewtons. Okay. Minus 8 kilonewtons. Minus RCY. And that's all of my Y direction forces, right? Okay. So what's RCY? Okay. This value that I just had, minus 8, ends up being negative 0.2354. Okay. So one of the things we talked about last time is that there are some people who like to use a technique of as soon as you determine that the direction you assumed for one of your reactions is wrong, that you flip the arrow. Okay? So let me ask you this. Is that something you guys want to do right now? Okay. You don't have to. You can get away with not doing it. I would say that this is a place where there's not that bad a consequence for you doing it. Okay? Why is that, you think? Because this segment of the problem ends up being fairly separated from the next segment of the problem. So if, if you really wanted to go in there and not have RCY pointing the wrong direction with a negative value, right? You could flip it in there and point it the direction it's actually going and put a positive value, and there's not really that bad a consequence, right? There's not any consequence. You're unlikely to uh, make errors later because of that. So anyway, I'm okay with whatever you want to do, though. You want to leave it alone? Let's leave it alone. Okay, so this is going to be equal to negative 0.2354. Kilonewtons. All right. Well, we're done with the first little part, but that wasn't anything new, right? We already knew how to do that part, right? Let's go on and do the part that we haven't really seen yet. Okay. And here's how we think about it. I'm going to take another copy of this thing and drop it right down here. All right. And your first step after finding your external reactions, which we're now done with, the first step is to figure out where you would like to cut through the structure and as you do this, you want to try to cut through no more than three members, if at all possible. Okay? Why do you think the number is three? Okay? So think about what we're left with after we separate this into two sections. What we're left with are typically non-concurrent force systems. 
Non-concurrent force systems have how many equilibrium equations that we can use? In 2D, there's three uh, equilibrium equations we can use for a non-concurrent force system. So if we have three things we don't know, then we can usually solve for all three of them, right? If we have more, we might be in a place where we can't, right? So you want to try to cut through no more than three as you cut through it. And, I, you know, it's typically not hard to figure out how you would do this. How would you do it in this case? Okay. You basically make a cut down through DE, DJ, and KJ, JK. Right. All right, so when we do that, everything you cut through, you now erase. And you've now separated this uh, thing into two pieces. All right? But you can't just do that because those things you just eliminated presumably have force in them, right? So you can't just get rid of them. So if you get rid of them, what do you have to replace them with? Forces. But you happen to know the direction of each one of those forces because the things you removed are two force members. And two force members have a line of action that you know, right? The line of action that exists in a two force member has to extend from joint to joint. OK? So what are we left with? Okay, we basically say that the effect of the member DE on joint D is to try to pull this this way, and the effect on E is to try to pull it back toward D, assuming that there was tension in that little link. All right, so this would be TDE and TDE. I'm trying to keep it all compact right here so you can see how it all works together. Okay? What about other things? So, TDJ. Okay? So, let me show a force this way and a force this way. Right? This would be TDJ and TDJ. And then you'd have one last one down here between J and K. TJK and TJK. All right. So we've got all of those pieces. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to copy this again. I might end up with more than I really want, but we'll clean it up here in just a second. Let me copy that over and look at just this chunk of it. At least we're going to try. Okay. So now imagine separating yourself from the situation before where we had the two different sections and now we're going <coughs> to, excuse me, focus in on just this section. And I'll tell you what, just to make that even clearer, let me drop it down here. We might need to add some more information if I dropped any along the way. But. <clears throat> we might have approached the uh, segment of the lecture where my computer crashes, but we'll see. All right. So there's my little section. My question is, looking at just that as a free body diagram, and what am I supposed to try to find? What did I say at the beginning? TDJ. OK. Is there anything I can do to find TDJ fairly easily? All right, someone I think is suggesting we should sum forces in the Y. Okay, so counting upward is positive. We'll say RHY, okay, is going to be 7.765 kilonewtons. 
then what? I need to know the slope of TDJ, right? So let me actually build a little slope indicator right there. What would that slope be for, for TDJ? Okay. Sometimes this takes a little bit of effort to figure. How far is it horizontally from J to D? All right. You can tell by symmetry, might be the easiest way, but you can tell by symmetry that it's going to be 1.5 meters leftward from J to D. Right? So I'm going to put in a 1.5 for the horizontal side there. What about vertically? Two. So when I put this in here, I'll, I'll add TDJ, but I need to multiply by a ratio that gives me just the vertical component. So I multiply by 2 over the square root of 2 squared plus 1.5 squared. And those are the only components I have <coughs> in the y direction. Ah, those are not the only components I have in the y direction. Someone says, are you going to subtract the 8 kilonewtons? You guys are keeping me honest. Minus 8 kilonewtons. Okay, and that's important, right? Because it is another force that's attached to this same structure. Okay. While we're here, is there, do I need to think about the 5 kilonewton force on that segment of the structure? Because it is not applied to this piece of the structure. Okay. So I don't need to think about the, uh, the 5 kilonewton force. But I do need to have the 8 kilonewton because it is part, it is applied to this section of the structure. Okay. Well, how, how do I find TDJ then? Okay. It's not very hard. All we got to do is, I guess, first collect uh, the terms that don't contain TDJ on one side of the expression. So that would give me, okay, something like this, where I have, um, you know, we'll say 8 minus 7 point seven six five okay now I need to multiply in a way that I get rid of the fraction that's near TDJ how do I multiply okay times the square root of 2 squared plus 1.5 squared and then the denominator I put 2 so TDJ will have a force of 0 0.29375 kilonewtons. Now, I've been going slow and trying to explain it a lot, but let's go back and review what did you have to do, really, to find TDJ. So what did we start with? We found the external reactions at C and H by just doing a plain uh, free body diagram of the whole thing, which you guys have probably had tons of practice with that kind of thing by now. Then I had to go and split the structure, right? Choose a place to split the structure so that my cut line went through one of the things I was trying to find, right? My, I'm trying to find DJ. And then I took one half of that, I picked one side, did a, you know, used the free body diagram of that one side, and then used one equation to solve for the thing that I didn't know. Can that be done in six minutes? I would say so, right? That is not that unreasonable to think that that could get done very, very quickly. You got a question? Oh, so his, his statement he just made is, if we had to find the other pieces, the other things that we didn't know on there, it would have taken more effort. 
right? Ah, okay, so he says, it just so happened that the variables worked out nice. We had one equation with that one variable in it. We didn't have to do a simultaneous solution, any of that kind of stuff. We're in good shape. Okay, well, what if I change the problem a little bit? What if right at the beginning, this is, you know, again, this is, let's say it's an exam problem, and all of a sudden I change this on you and say, I'm not trying to get you to find dj, right? No, no, I'm going to get you to find DE. Okay? And you haven't done any of it yet, right? I said, now, that, now this is a different problem. You've, you're approaching this problem fresh, and now it says DE. What are your steps now? Yeah, your first steps are no different. Right? You still find your external reactions. Good. We still break it up into two sections. Right? That part's good. We can even still pick the right-hand section. Right? This part's still good. All that's good. The only thing that's different now is there's no reason we would have done this yet. Right? So let's pretend we hadn't. Right? There's no reason that we would have done that equation if the only thing we're trying to find is DE. All right, so now what do we do to find DE, TDE? Okay, someone says, we could sum some moments. Around what? Okay, someone says, let's pick point J, and I agree. What if we sum moments around point J? Okay, now what we have is RHY that's going to have a counterclockwise effect around J. Right, so I'll put that in as 7.765 kilonewtons multiplied by what length? Four meters, right? That's the length from the line of action of RHY to J. Okay. Now we have another counterclockwise effect, assuming that DE's intention, right? So we'll have TDE. Do I need to take any particular component of that? No, it already points uh, horizontally, and I have a vertical distance from that line of action to point J, right? So I multiply it by that vertical distance of two meters. Okay, and because I missed it last time, and because it's always a good thing to think about, should we have that eight kilonewtons in there anywhere? No, because it already has a line of action that goes through J, and we're summing moments, not forces. Right, so there's no moment created around J by the eight kilonewtons that's attached to J. All right, so what do we have for TDE? Thoughts? Okay. Yeah, basically it's going to be two times, right, 7.765 kilonewtons, right, because I've got four and two right here. We'll go ahead and work it out, right? 7.765 times four divided by two, right? Now the sign, okay? To really do that properly, I would notice that these both have the same sign when they're both on the left side, and to do that math that I just did, one of them would have had to move to the other side, which would make it negative, and this would end up being a negative, whatever this answer is, right? 15.53 kilonewtons. Okay, that means that that member up there is in compression, not in tension. Wonderful. All right. Well, shall we change it up again? Okay. He says, no, let's leave all this work available 
and then find the third one, right? Except this would all be work that you would have had to do first if you need it, right? If, if I, you know, let's say, you know, in, in the exam room, you have a different problem than the person sitting next to you, right? Person sitting next to you, maybe there said, no, you don't want to find the force in DE. You want to find the force in JK. And it's not just JK, right? This is for real. So what we're going to do is the same steps again, right? We're going to go through the uh, you know, free body diagram of the entire thing, find the external reactions, go on and find you know, this, these two halves split apart. Okay. Now at this point, there's two different ways you could go, right? You could look at the left free body diagram this time instead of the right one. If you look at the left one instead of the right one, what do you notice? OK. Yeah, if you take a moment around point D, if you're looking at the left free body diagram, then the two things that you don't know, TDJ and TDE, right, won't show up in a sum of moments around point D. And you'll be able to solve for the one thing that you needed, which was TJK. All right? So you could do that. And I don't actually need to work that out for you, per se, because you would already know how to do that. But what I do want to show you is another thing that you might not think of. Okay? Maybe you didn't even need to have the left free body diagram. Maybe you can do the same thing with the right free body diagram. So let me show you this. Okay. What if we already had a diagram drawn for the right side, but we didn't have any of this other work yet? Okay. Now let me, I'm going to give myself some room here to really explain this. When you choose a point to some moments around, is there anything that restricts your choice as to which point you choose? Or can you pick any point in this two-dimensional space? You can pick any point you want in the two-dimensional space. It's up to you to choose which point you're going to sum moments around. OK? Well, so let's choose one that makes sense for us to do if what we're trying to find is TJK. And the one that makes sense to me is to extend a line for this for force over here and extend a line for this force over here, find that intersection and some moments around that point, even though it's not on this figure. Right? It's not on this, the actual members that I'm including here, but I'm still going to choose that point to some moments around. Since all the members are straight, right, I, would, I can actually name that point point D if I want to because that is where it is physically. It just so happens that joint D is not part of this body, right? It is still a location in space. All right, so what if I choose D, and now I want to know uh, what is uh, TJK? What should I do? Some moments around D. Again, I'll take counterclockwise positive. OK. So what do I need to include here? RHY. And what's the length from the line of action of RHY to point D? OK. Might have to go up here to re recall it. But if you go from the line of action of RHY, it goes over two and a half meters plus three meters to get to D, right? So that would end up giving me five and a half meters. Okay. What else creates moments around point D? Okay. Eight kilonewtons, right? Clockwise. So that would be minus eight kilonewtons. And how far is the line of action of 8 kilonewtons away from point D? One and a half meters, right? And last but not least, T 
TJK has a line of action that's two meters away from point D. So I would subtract that TJK, okay, subtracting because it would create a clockwise rotation around D, the direction that I'm showing TJK, again at two meters. All right. Fair enough. Now what's TJK? All right, looks to me like what we're going to do, uh, we need uh, to plug in our value for RHY, right? 7.765 kilonewtons. Okay, we know that. All right, so it looks to me like what we would do is we would take, I'm going to do a fraction here, and we'll do 7.765 times 5.5. All right minus 8 times 1.5, all of this over 2. 15.354 or so. And this one does turn out to be positive, right? And what does positive mean? It really is tension, right? We assume tension. Turns out positive means it really is carrying tension in that member. All right? And that's basically the idea of the method of sections, right? You can cut through uh, up to three members. Typically, you will cut through exactly three members, right? Um, your cut needs to go through the member that you are trying to investigate, right? And then you'll do a free body diagram to one side or the other of the cut that you just made. And you'll be able to solve for the forces that were opened up by making that cut. OK? So let me re reiterate one more time. When is it important to know method of sections versus knowing method of joints? OK? If you have members that are kind of way on the inside toward the middle of your structure, and it would take you a lot of steps to go from where you know something to the thing that you're trying to find, either, either a lot of steps or a lot of simultaneous equations, one way or the other, right? That's going to be a lot of work if you do that. Well, you can avoid doing a lot of that work by, instead of doing free body diagrams of joints, doing free body diagrams of entire sections, and that way you don't have to deal with the forces internally in those sections. So then that's when you would use a method of sections. Okay? So let me give you one other tip on this. Um, it is pretty easy for your instructors to give you trusses that have a lot of zero force members inside of them. Okay? So let's say, let's say I give you one that's kind of like that, right? What if I give you something that looks kind of like a roof truss? And it looks like this. Okay. And I give you, you know, it's kind of some standard support kind of things on the ends, like this. And I put a, a force up here on the top, right? And, uh, you know, all the different members are labeled and all that. Everything's all good. I didn't mean for this to look all curvy down here. This is supposed to be a nice straight uh, bottom side. Okay. And then I tell you, uh, I want you to solve for uh, the force in this member right here. All right. What method do you use? Okay. Someone says, looks like maybe I should use the method of sections. It's way deep inside of there. Okay. You could use whichever. Okay. So he says joints really isn't even any harder. 
And I would agree with that because, look at this. This is a zero force member based on the bottom joint. This is a zero force member based on that joint. This is a zero force member based on that joint. That's a zero force member. Okay. I have to stop at that point because now I have four members at that joint. But I've got another zero force member over here, another one here, another one here, another one there. And now I can go back to this one and say that's a zero force member too. And so now, the, you know, if you look at it this way, you say, as soon as I find the force in this member, then I will have already found the force in that member. And you can essentially use a method of joints. You can just look at that one joint where that one reaction happens, and you can get straight to the thing that you want to know. So yeah. How can you remove that second one? There's a fourth joint at the top right there. OK. So. The question was, how can I get rid of that center member because I have this force applied to the top right here? Tell you what, I'm going to put all these back in. Right, so remember, I'm looking at the joint at the bottom to get rid of this member. I'm looking at the joint up here on the top to get rid of this member. I'm looking at the joint down here on the bottom to get rid of that member. I'm looking at the joint up here on the top to get rid of that member. And I'm looking at this joint right here to get rid of this member. I don't care what's going on on the top side of that member because I'm looking at this joint right here, and that's the basis why I can say that vertical member is a zero force member. Yeah? That's because there's no possible life force at that joint. That that's right. So he's saying that's because if I had a member here, and as long as this bottom side is straight, straight across like this, Okay, it, looking at a free body diagram of that member, what it would look like is I've got two horizontal forces coming from the two members coming into that joint, along with a potential force perpendicular to that. If I did a free body or a uh, set of equilibrium equations on that and looked at the y direction, the vertical direction, I would only have one force. And so based on that joint right there, I could not have any force in that vertical member. Right? So that's why um, I know that that's a zero force member. Practically what happens is the force that is applied to the top actually gets transmitted down these sides and none of it goes down this one. Okay? So that was a tricky little, you know, sometimes we can give you one where, you know, you're trying to find something deep in the middle of it. And yet, because there's so many zero force members, maybe the method of joints is still easier. Although neither one of them is that hard for this particular question. All right. In general, though, what you're always looking for is, you know, if you see a joint that's, you know, pretty easy to get to, right, without too many steps using method of joints, then sometimes method of joints is easier. Um, you know. Thing is, either way can be used for analyzing the whole truss, right? So although I would say if that's your task, if, if someone says, I want you to find every force in the entire truss, then uh, you know, the, the free body diagrams are at least easier when you're doing method of joints, right? So you may as well just use method of joints because you need to find all of them anyway. OK? so. Cool. Any, uh, any other questions or comments? Fabulous.